we very definitely are the agents of evolution. We, we and our culture have created the technology that now has created new evolutionary processes in new media, in cultural media and in software that are now beginning to explore further uh, with and without our help in some cases, uh, the reaches of design space. We're entering new territory every day. And that's the way evolution has been for three billion years and counting. Daniel Dunnett is filosoof en schreef veelvuldig over evolutie, het bewustzijn en kunstmatige intelligentie. Hij vertelt in het komend kwartier over robot-evolutie en post-intelligent design. Welkom bij Tegenlicht Talks. I think we're at the edge of a new age where our capacity to design things intelligently. We are the first intelligent designers in the history of life on this planet. And we reach the point now where we are laying the foundations for exploiting evolution itself, natural selection in various media to do a lot of the intelligent design for us. And so we're moving into the sort of post-intelligent design age and that's going to be a further evolutionary Darwinian process which will carry us who knows where. You can never predict where evolution is going to take you because evolution is the amplification of accidents. Yes, we're robots made of robots made of robots made of robots made of robots. Uh, if you look at a a single cell, a neuron or an astrocyte, that cell is a sort of autonomous robot of itself. And if you look inside the cell, you find even more robotic parts moving around. Motor proteins are very clearly, they're, they're not even alive, they're, they're just proteins, but there they are marching around inside a cell, um, carrying goods, uh, creating little highways and walking along the highways, and doing all the transport that's needed inside a cell. Those are robots for sure. They're nanorobots. The individual cells are more autonomous than we often give them credit for. And they, especially I think brain cells are, uh, they have agendas. <laughs> they have to stay alive and they they have choices to make about which connections to form. Now they don't, they're not conscious. Heavens no, they're, they're, they're robots. How does the mind pop up? That's, that's the question that concerns me the most. And I think that if we look at the minds of most animals, in fact, of all animals, except for human beings, we find that the talents of those brains are very different from ours. They, they have tremendous competences to do, to hunt, to, to protect their young, to mate, to, to live in a difficult world. But they're not, I'm pretty sure, reflective the way we are. They don't, they don't have a viewpoint on life and the world that we have. Now, how in the world do you ever get that out of 200 billion clueless little robots? And the answer, I think, is only because of enculturation, only through culture. There has to have been a co-evolutionary process. Our brains, unlike the brains of our chimpanzee and bonobo relatives, have some significant differences and we're going to discover a lot more. But one of the main ones is we pay attention to speech sounds and that has a huge effect 
on the structuring of, of our brains. Infants have already been listening to their mother's voice in the womb for several months, and they're already attuned to their native language the day they're born. And they're intensely interested, intensely curious. That's a genetically transmitted feature. It's a, in the same way the suckling reflex and, and, and uh, putting your hands out when you fall, the other reflexes are genetically transmitted. There is, our brains are genetically designed, that is, there are genes which, uh, which make our brains different from the brains of chimpanzees and bonobos, which prepare the brains for culture. The traditional view is that culture is the product of human minds, of human intelligence. And that's the same mistake as the pre-Darwinian view of how life is created by an intelligent designer. Culture, today we have intelligent designers. We have artists and musicians, composers and scientists and engineers. But culture was created by a process which is profoundly Darwinian. Culture evolved in the early days of human culture were not at all like today's human culture. And they were humanoids, human hominins, human, human our, our ancestors. And they were, they were really clueless like other animals, but they gradually acquired habits which were infectious, which they could pass among themselves. Uh, and these grew and grew, and out of this came language. And once you've got language, natural language, which no other species has, then you build this tremendous information highway between parents and offspring, which enhances the information highway that's already there in the genome, and it also other animals have this other information highway where, where offspring learn from their parents. But in our species, this is trebly, doubly enhanced. We have very long childhood. We have uh, shared attention with mother. We have many opportunities for teaching and learning. And it makes a huge difference because our childhoods are spent downloading information into our brains like apps. And the information we're downloading is not just raw environmental information, which is all other species get. It's good tricks, good ideas, good categories, good ways of thinking, good habits of thought. And these come automatically with language and with all the things that language brings in. So our brains are stocked with software that we don't have to design for ourselves. Human culture started very Darwinian with not much understanding, not much comprehension. And as culture developed, we created the world we live in today, which is the age of intelligent design. We have a lot of very intelligent creators and they have a lot of technology that they use. And we're right on the edge of the next phase, which is post-intelligent design, if you like. And that's when some of our intelligent designers, quite a few of them, have begun to realize that evolution can do the job better than they can in some regards. So you have in the arts, in science, in technology, you have research efforts, research and development efforts, which are harnessing evolutionary processes, natural selection, to come up with better designs. The same thing is happening in artificial intelligence. The first wave of artificial intelligence, sometimes called GoFi or good old-fashioned AI, was hand coding, do it all by hand. Type in the, all the facts that you want your robot to know, fact at a time. Well, there's still people working on that, but the 
current phase of machine learning, deep learning, says, no, no, you want to do it nature's way. I think these evolutionary methods are the only way we will ever create a robot mind which is uh, a, a worthy companion, as it were, to ours. And then, of course, it might even exceed ours. In principle, it could. We've always looked for the simplest possible model of a, of a human mind or human brain that could do the work that a brain does. And what we're now coming to realize is that 200 billion neurons, no two of which are alike, no two of which are alike, plus 10 times more astrocytes, other glial cells, that's a lot of tiny agents in there. And if you have to model them all to get the sort of open-ended versatility and creativity of a, of a human mind, then you're not going to do it by handwork. Uh, you're going to have a process which structures and organizes all of this, these armies the way nature does it. If we look at IBM's Watson, which played the Jeopardy puzzle game on television and won, many people were impressed, but they should have recognized that this was actually very restricted, very one-dimensional game, and that Watson couldn't hold a normal conversation, could answer those quiz questions, but did not have the 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 rest of the mind to go with its contestant mind and building that would be a job let's say two or three or five orders of magnitude larger than the job of building watson <laughs> right now you've got a tenth of a percent <laughs> of a of a program that can pass the turing test so we're still a long way off of a proper turing test but I, that doesn't mean it isn't possible. I think it is possible. And we already have examples in, in films of what that would be like. I think that uh, Spike Jones film, Her, uh, the Samantha, the artificial intelligence that uh, 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 Joaquin Phoenix uh, in the movie falls in love with, uh, is, is a pretty reasonable example of what that would be like. I am afraid that we will settle for cheap substitutes and forget that they're cheap substitutes. That does worry me. I think that, as usual, the entering wedge will be benign and will make very good sense. And I think we've already seen it. Uh, we have robot companions for old folks who are perhaps getting a little demented. And this is a user-friendly agency of sorts that can help them get around in their house and they will grow fond of this. It will be like a dog, only better in some ways. And they will become very dependent and very attached to these robots. And they will, the robots will be doing a job which is demanding and not very pleasant for a human being to do. So suppose that this becomes the rule. It all looks wonderful. But it also paves the way for a certain sort of cost-benefit analysis thinking to enter into the world. So we then think, well, today old folks, tomorrow just lonely people of any age. This technology will change our minds. Now the question is, will it change our minds for the better or not? And I'm sure it will be for the better in some regards. 
But in many ways, or in some ways, it may be for the worse. It's going to be a huge change in any case. And I don't think we've thought through what it's apt to be. So I'm not without any anxieties about what the future holds. I have some very real ones. I think they're miscast if you worry about the singularity when the superhuman intelligence is here. Uh, long before that day is reached, subhuman intelligence is going to replace superhuman intelligence in many areas and people will stop caring about the difference.